All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, we actually have some people in class tonight, so we're probably going to be picking on y'all. Um, we're going over chapter three, which is duties and disclosures to third parties. Uh, when I'm talking about third parties, I'm talking about someone that's not exactly part of the transaction. Say if I'm doing like um, a listing contract, then the two parties would be the broker and the seller, right? If you're doing a, a contract between buyer and seller, the two parties would be buyer and seller. The uh, third parties are gonna be like lenders and attorneys and other people like that. Uh, we're also gonna go over stigmatized properties tonight. So that should be interesting. And when I say stigmatized, I am talking about ghosts and aliens. So that should be an interesting topic to cover. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. with our outline for the evening. Uh, we're going to go over non-fiduciary duties. And we're going to go over the general duties of honesty and fairness. We'll define third party and obligations to the third party. We'll avoid disclosure and misrepresentation problems. Uh, we'll go a little bit over section 5.008 of the Texas Property Code, which is the seller's disclosure, which y'all have probably seen multiple times, especially in promulgated forms class. Uh, we'll also talk again about material facts. Um, those will be physical material facts and any material facts relating to title and, and survey issues like that. Um, and then, like I said, yeah, we're doing stigmatized properties. There's a couple uh, different types. There's purely psychological stigmas and then there's physical stigmas. Uh, and we'll, go, we'll also go over the guidelines for disclosure of stigmatized properties um, and certain prohibited disclosures to third parties. Um, and lastly, we'll go over liability for misrepresentation. So first up is non-fiduciary duties. Um, these are duties that are owed to customers, which are not clients, and to the general public, consumers. Um, I mean, let's see if y'all were actually paying attention yesterday. What makes the difference between a customer or a client. Do you remember, Carla? What What's the one thing you need to make a difference between a customer and a client? Um, customer is so a client is more personal. Like you get to be able to learn more about the prices. You're in the right direction. Okay. Wow. Um, the only thing that that judges the difference between a cons uh, a customer or a client is contract. If I have a contract to represent that person, uh, those are the, that's the difference. So if you're you are oh, once you get into the uh, it, yeah, if I have a contract for representation, not a, then they are client. Not a like a wonderful family contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like, like a representation yeah. agreement. Yeah. Um. So. This will be discussed throughout the chapter and it'll be in the book if you actually want to use the book online. It is there and discussed in that as well. Uh, it's basically just saying that you owe certain rights, I mean, certain, you owe certain things to third party individuals and there's certain things that you don't owe as well. Um, and we're going to go over that. So you just got to, it's also about avoiding misrepresentation. I mean, someone could think that I am representing them. I mean, if I, if I think like it, your agent, and I act like your agent, then what am I? I'm your agent. And they, they might see me as their agent, even though we don't have a contract. My actions might say, hey, I am your agent, based on what I do. All right. So the general duties of honest and fairness uh, the general duties of honest and fairness are to all parties, all parties involved in the transaction. That's just a basic human thing. Just be fair and honest, right? Just, you were taught that by your parents, correct? <laughs> I hope you were. Um, but th this is this right here. Fairly does not always mean equally. So let's say I've got a client for a million dollars, and then I have Wyatt over here who's purchasing a $10,000 property. I mean, which do you think I'm probably going to put more effort into? 
the one million dollars, of course. Um, and yeah, they're probably going to ask for more from me as well because they're buying such a big property. Um, so uh, yeah, fairly does not always mean equally. You still want to treat people fair and honest, but um, sometimes it may be a little different between you know clients that you have. Well, we, uh, we'll be an example. Of that. An example uh, that would. That would be yeah, like like I was saying, the ten million dollars. Like, oh, like that. Okay. Yeah, that would be a good example. Like treat everyone like that. Yeah, still treat it fairly, of course, but you're, yeah, I'm still probably gonna put more effort into the million dollar one, of course. Yeah. Um, so licensees must balance the fiduciary duty of confidentiality with the duty of honesty. So there's a fine line there of things that you can and cannot say. I'm still learning myself. Uh, certain wording. Uh, every now and then I'll have to have Justin come in and be like, hey, is this wording correct? Should I send this? You know, um, and he'll either tell me no, let me let me change it up a bit. Um, so there's there's a fine line between that. Some things you cannot, you cannot disclose to the other parties. And some things you can't, if you just honest, you consider honesty. Uh, I think we'll go into those in more detail as well. Um, but I, me personally, I like a client trusting me. Um, if my client trusts me and let me do what I do, then I can, I can work that way. It, it, a lot of people think that real estate agents, we get paid a ton of money and we don't really do much. They don't know exactly what we go through. So sometimes it's good to kind of show them what you've done for them. Like say, uh, if you get like the the final disclosure for a closing or something like that, you you send it to your client and be like, hey, I got this, I went over it, I this this and this I saw, stuff like that. If you if you send them stuff like that and show them that you are actually doing stuff, I mean they don't know the exact process of course, but a lot of people just think we get paid a ton of money to do to put a sign in the yard, you know, and that's not the case at all. We negotiate we write forms we go to back and forth to houses we show houses. we open houses all kinds of different like, things things like the amount of driving i don't like i didn't never realize how much oh, yeah. that is yeah oh yeah it's gonna drive go somewhere else it's like yeah, you gotta travel just to go see that house <laughs> yeah, you gotta drive a lot man mm -hmm. and one of my clients i've had forever yeah he knows about it yeah i probably showed him 60 houses uh and he Went with another firm a few weeks ago. He said, We're going to he said, I'm going to another firm, I'm going to a bigger firm. Not because of anything that I did. Uh, it's just that right now, because of the market, bigger firms are selling in their firm. Yeah. So any contract that I put in isn't gonna have as much of a chance of being accepted. So he went to a bigger firm. So I wasted tons of yeah, gas, tons of miles. miles. Yeah. With no like nothing at all, no well. We, I did get paid for the sale yeah. of his house, but yeah, after after the sale, I didn't get anything out of that work yet. And I would have liked to, of course, with all that work I did. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned yesterday about um, the number of clients you can you can't spend times on. Right. Yeah. I I don't know. For me, like I don't want more than like five, maybe six at a time. Yeah. That's a good amount where like if somebody has a showing, I can set I can schedule it and in the next few days we can go look at it or whatever. But like at one that. point where like the off seems like a lead generator system we have, and I was just accepting every single one that came in. And then I looked on one day and I had like twenty three clients. And I didn't know but then like every week you have to update like your status, like, you know, where are you at with this transaction or whatever? And like it would pop up like update your status with this person. I'm like, who's who is Taylor? I don't yeah. like I like forgot half of them because like I I yeah. talked to them on the phone once and then I was like, cool, I'll get I'll get to you later and then I got to try with other stuff. Yeah. And, like, yeah. Two weeks go by and I'm like, I don't even know who half these people are. So I just had to delete a bunch of them and now I have I think like seven or six or seven. And it's like I can focus on them and like that's a good number where I can yeah. kind of keep in touch. There's a couple of them I have that they're in the middle of like kind of fixing a financial situation. So like while I have them on here. I know I don't have to talk to them for like two months because they'll go like, we'll get back to you in a few months once we kind of figure everything out. All right, cool. I'll do. If you don't get, get to me by like the end of June, 
I'll send you a message and say, hey, how we going or whatever. But like, I know there's some people that I can kind of push off to the side for a little later. And but yeah, more than like six or seven. Um, yeah, so even six is a little push. Yeah, up. but it depends. It really depends on it depends on the people. The people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, the client that I just told you I lost, he was a big time kicker. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't take much more than him and maybe two more. Yeah. Uh, especially if you're dealing with higher end clients, mm -hmm. you're probably only going to want a couple of those because they're going to be on you like that. Yeah. I got one client I'm dealing with that's so time consuming that. Yeah. You know, totally I think half my work time goes to him. And then the other half goes to split thing in or whatever. It's like it's, it's yeah, so, it's, it's, it's so you got there's a there's a delicate balance and you gotta find that balance. And I'm still trying to find mine sometimes, but it really just depends on the people. But I would say five. You once you go past yeah. five, you're I mean five you're busy all yeah. the time anyways. So yeah. uh, any more than that, if you can handle it, you know. Um so yeah, so there's a there's a fine balance between those two. And we'll go over that. Uh, let's define third parties and the third party ob obligations. Uh, so a third party is defined as, in the example here, in a listing agreement for an agency service, the two parties are the broker and seller. Like I said, if it's a listing contract, it's not between the buyer and the seller, it's the broker and the seller. Um, and the buyer would be the third party to that contract. If that makes sense. Um, third parties would also be, like I said, lenders, appraisers, um, maybe an attorney, stuff like that. Those are going to be the third parties, the people that might be up in the transaction in some way, but not exactly a part of the transaction. If that makes sense. So we've defined third parties. What are the obligations to the third parties? Um, so you're going to want to treat honest, fairness, and competent. That's, that's a big one right there. Uh, competency. Texas real estate commission says if you pass the exam, you're technically competent, but are you really, if you haven't made any sales, if you haven't gone and done anything, are you really competent? No. <laughs> Trek says you are because you passed the exam in their eyes, you're competent. But all the <laughs> let's say I got a client and he wants me to show him a property in Dallas. Yeah. Am I am I competent in Dallas? No, no I'm not because I don't live there. I don't know the area very well. So what would I need to do in a situation like that? <clears throat> the, that would be one way. But the the best thing in that situation to do would be to get someone that I know that is aware of that area and have them come with me. I mean, that all licensed agent? Yeah. Okay. Well, like, and, 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 are you from Dallas? You? Uh, yeah. So like, if, yeah, if, if, you, if, if you were licensed or whatever, just send them over to Yeah, yeah I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be. Sorry. Go ahead. How would that work with like a commission or like, say for instance, uh, if I'm house? That would be worked out between me and you. Yeah. So like, I would still get the same commission and Justin would still get the same commission, but whatever commission that I make, I could split with you any way that we agree. So uh, I wouldn't like exactly just give you the listing unless I didn't have time. And then I'd be like, hey, here you go, have a listing. But uh, or, or, uh, I, I did that. I had a client in kind of like the Lano, kind of, you know, West Texas, so, you know, Central West Texas area. But like Josh lives in Marble Falls. And so for me, if they want to look at a house here, I want to show them a house. And they're like, how about this house? And they wanted to look at something way over there. And I was like, cool. Well, y'all can go look at it with Josh. I'm going to send you all over to him because I'm not driving three and a half hours to show you a house he might not like. But I sent it with Josh and I basically just told him, like, I'll pay you whenever they buy something from me, I'll pay you like a hundred dollar showing fee for going and showing this house. If they want that house, I'll let you do it. But we'll split the commission like if you did, like whatever it was, we'll right. split it because I technically got the lead and showed a couple houses here. Yeah. So I'll, we'll just, and we kind of worked out our own kind of deal that way. So like I said at the beginning of class, the lease that I have that I can't show because I'm teaching now, I'm splitting that commission. I, I decided 50 50 with him, but it's 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 a lease, so it's not going to be a ton of money. Yeah. Uh, if it was an actual sale, I probably would split it a little differently because I'm still going to be doing a lot of work. He's just doing the showing, you know. <laughs> uh, but 
Sure. Yeah. Well. So it can sometimes it can be hard to tell your client, hey, I'm not exactly competent in that area. But if you do express that to them, it's going to make them probably feel better that you're telling the truth. Like, hey, I'm not sure about this area, but I can definitely get you with someone or bring someone along that is that can help you with that. Mm -hmm. And that'll give you some good credibility with your client for sure. Um, so track. Oh, yeah. Uh, so competency. Uh, there's also good faith, of course, and disclosure of any material facts. Those are the th obligations that you have to the third party. Uh, Trek rules of fairness promptly presenting all offers, uh, no matter what they are. Even if your client says no, present every offer, every single one. Uh, never skip on any of them. You get in some serious trouble doing that. Uh, and you also want to avoid misrepresentation and false promises. Like I said, sometimes if I think like an ag your agent and I act like your agent, I'm your agent. Uh, but misrepresentation, we'll go into a little bit more detail later, uh, but never ever guarantee anything to your clients. Never guarantee anything. Because uh, I don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen there. Do you, Wyatt? Do you know the future? Well, if you do, uh, give me the lottery numbers. <laughs> That'd be great. I could use those. Um, <laughs> yeah, how's, how's Bitcoin? How's the stocks? Yeah. It's going to be in five years. We're all out of business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, straight down. That's where it's going. Uh, but never never guarantee anything to your client. So if it, sometimes a client might try and pressure you to say something. Like they'll say, well, well how, what do you think this roof up there? And I'm going to say, well, I don't know. I'm not an inspector. It looks all right to me, but we need to get an inspector out here. And then they'll, they'll just keep asking, hey, but what do you think of the roof? What do you think of the roof? That they're trying to get me to trip up so that they can sue me. And that, and that might happen. They'll try and get you to say something. So watch what you say and never promise anything. Uh, you do, never, ever. So like anything. even asking, like, what do you think is roof? Your opinion there would be? I would tell the client, I would say in my opinion, in my opinion, yeah. I think it looks fine, but I'm not an inspector. It's that like, it's, your it's advice, opinion, getting out of yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. it's giving them advice, but also covering my butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? They can use that against you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And some people will. I haven't had they're that with me yet. That? Do what? Like they're like looking to do that? Oh yeah. Yes. They're looking to suit. Yeah. yeah. So some people are like that. I haven't run into any of myself yet. So. Okay. I'm pretty sure Justin has, uh, so they'll try and trip you up. Yeah. So never promise anything. And, and you're, you, I mean, you were supposed to just, if you have information or you think, you know, if you can look at a house and see that it's foundation issues just based on, you know, you can look around and just tell, mm -hmm. you can tell them that, but don't make it sound like this house has foundation issues. Yeah, don't make so it, make it like, like, by looking at that, I could probably say that it's this, but I wouldn't know for 100%. Yeah. But like, I've just seen that before in houses that haven't. Mm -hmm. And that covers you because that is the, that is a sign that, you know, there's yeah. cracks coming out from the doors or whatever. That is a sign of foundation issues. But I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that, like, I've seen it before and sometimes it happens. So I don't know. <laughs> just, just just it is, yeah. yeah. But yeah. it helps them know yeah. like you are giving them your information. They know that that house could have foundation issues. And that, like, you, you inform them, but at the same time, yeah. they'll make it a, a solid. A solid thing, yeah. Don't, it kind of vague or whatever. Yeah, don't yeah. make it sound like a fact, yeah. Yeah, make it sound like a fact. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So, avoiding problems, misrepresentation. So, misrepresentation can either be intentional or unintentional. Uh, intentional uh, misrepresentation would be like me saying, uh, I'm selling a house and saying this house is perfectly structurally sound, even though I know for a fact it has termites all throughout it. That would be intentional misrepresentation. Rep misrepresentation. Intentional. Let's see if I can give you an example of intention unintentional. Um, let's say a client I, of mine. Uh, I'm selling a property. Um, she calls me and she wants to give me a form with some serious information and I just say, okay, okay, uh, thank you. Just send it my way and I've got to go. I can't, I can't talk right now or something like that. And then I don't exactly implement the information she gave me. So maybe it's something really important to the property. Um, 
I didn't do it intentionally. I just got busy or something like that. Uh, it would be an unintentional misrepresentation because I'm missing a fact that she gave me. Um, I guess that would that'd be a decent example of uh, unintentional. Unintentional can happen as well. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, false promises on material facts. That's a big one. And also another big one is failure to disclose red flags. We could probably talk about this one for a while. Um, so it's like if I'm uh, so it's like if uh, I'm showing a property and I notice cracking around the doors and the windows and everything like that, but I don't disclose it to my client. They don't maybe they don't notice it and I don't disclose it to them. I just go off of what the seller's disclosure says. Oh, he's not going to lie. It's the seller's disclosure. He's going to tell me everything he knows about the house. It's probably fine. But in reality, I saw cracks, and those cracks could mean something structural. It could just be settlement, too. But if you see things like that, you've got to point it out to your client. You've got to. And a lot of things can be considered a red flag. Uh, you might see certain parts of the outside of the house missing pieces might be a termite you might see wet like water on the top of the ceiling there could be a leak there um, and a lot of those things clients may not know about but you you're not an inspector yourself either but you've seen it and you say hey look at that that might be an issue when you get an inspector to look at it um, so if you if you fail to disclose something like that it it can i think I, it can lead to you actually losing your license um and being sued as well because remember if if you if i'm selling a property and like i said earlier like misrepresentation if i told them it's structurally sound even though it has termites um then I failed to disclose something and I could lose my license as well. And then that would also be considered DTPA or deceptive trade practices. So I could get sued for three times the damages. That's why we can't take a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. because you need to be able to have time to look everything. That's what it feels like. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot there's a lot that we do that your client doesn't even know about. And it's and it's all for them. That's why I said you gotta try and show them that you're you're working for them. You're not just sitting on your butt with a sign in the yard, you know. Oh, that's misconceptions too. Yep. From a lot of people. Um. So red flags are a big one. If you see something, try and point it out. Maybe your client didn't see it. So um, always disclose anything that looks like it could be an issue. So there's liability with misrepresentations. Uh, materiality, materiality, materiality of issue. That's like I was saying the other day, like blue pipes in the wall. Is that really a material issue? No, that doesn't affect anything. Um, and also, were the statements in, were they a fact or an opinion? Um, and we'll go over fact and opinion a little bit later. But as I was saying, some things you want to make, make sound like an opinion and not fact. If you have a fact, well, then you have a fact. You know, you can say the fact uh, as long as you have proof of that fact. Um, but yeah, some things you want to keep on the side of opinion. So let's say like, for example, I have a client and they're telling me, uh, I see cracking on the roof and I tell them, hey, uh, we need, might need to get an inspection out here to see what the cracking is. And my client says, oh, no, 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 it's fine. We'll just we'll paint over it. We'll cover it up. It's not a big issue. What should I do in that sort of situation? What do you think, Gio? Uh, I don't know. Don't know? Um, so I can say that, um, I would, in that situation, I would tell him, 
okay? We can paint over it, but if I don't disclose this lawsuit, I just keep, I'd say lawsuit. I just say lawsuit probably three times and then he'd be like, okay, uh, yeah, we'll disclose it. I mean, nobody wants a lawsuit, right? Because if, if we if we cover that up and we don't disclose it, then yes, that would be a set of trade practice. So if we're if we have a house for a million dollars, that's three times damages. We can paint out three million dollars. So in that situation, uh, that's what I would tell them. Is, yeah, we got to disclose it unless you want a lawsuit. Do you want a lawsuit? I don't think you do. Because it'll happen if we don't disclose it. It'll happen. Um, and then what if he says like, okay, well, we got to cover that up before we list. In that situation, I would tell him, um, okay, let's get an inspector out here. If I get an inspector out here uh, in that inspection port report, we'll have everything that's wrong with the house. So when a buyer comes yeah. and says, what's that there? Uh, we'll also have what, what, so what's wrong with the house and what we fixed. It'll all be on the report. And uh, so if a buyer comes and says, what's that there? I can say, well, we got an inspector out. This is what we found, but you're more than welcome to bring an inspector out as well to make sure on what we found. Yeah. So it just basically like that, it would cover both of us in that situation. Uh, just, just by getting an inspection. All right, more on avoiding problems. Uh, section 5.008 asks the seller's disclosure of property condition. That's a very, very important form. Uh, let's see, well, who do we got online? Oh, Miss Vera looks like she's about to pass out. <laughs> How you doing? I'm um, all right. Been better. Been better? Mm -hmm. uh, so I got a question for you. Go ahead. When do you think a seller's disclosure is filled out? Is it before the transaction, after the transaction? When do we fill out a seller's disclosure form? I would say before. Correct. It's before pretty much anything, before I list your property, before all that. Uh, that's when you would do the seller's disclosure. And it's required for most residential transactions. Most, not all, some are, some are exempt. Um, and the big part right there is completed by the seller, not the agent. You can get a lot of trouble for that. You can get a ton of trouble for filling out one. Uh, Justin told me one time he had a million dollar client. He was gonna list his property, uh, but the client would not do a seller's disclosure form. And he told him multiple times, lawsuit, lawsuit, we gotta get this done. And he still wouldn't sign it. So. Justin walked away and we're like, you walked away from a million dollar transaction? It's like, yeah, I walked away. <laughs> I'm not getting sued for three million. Yeah. I ain't doing that. So did they guy get sued? Well, he doesn't know. He didn't uh, they, Yeah, after that he was like, all right, bye. Yeah. You know. But it's completed by the seller. You as an agent will never complete the form. Um, if you try to, Justin will probably or your broker will probably be very, very angry with you. Um, so if, if your client tells me, hey, I'm not filling out that seller's disclosure, I'm probably going to say, well, I'm not filling out, so I don't know who it is. You know, are you going to fill it out? Because I ain't going to fill it out. Because um, I never lived in the property. I can't properly fill out a seller's disclosure. How would I know about what's wrong with the property if I've never lived in it? That's why the seller actually fills out the disclosure and not the agent. Um, so there's a TAR form or a TR form, the Texas Realtors form. There's also the TREC form. Now the TREC form is the minimum amount that you can have. Uh, we're, the form's coming up so you can see an example of it. But the TREC form is very, very basic. There's not a whole lot to it. Uh, most places are going to uh, do the Texas Realtors form. It's way more detailed. Um, so let's say this. What if uh, what if my client wants me to use the TREC form, the one with the minimum, but my broker tells me that I need to use the TR form? 
Who do I listen to? Anybody in class? You're like broken, but check with our check with probably going to take your and we'll produce under your license. So that's the thing. Always your client. Always your client. You, client trumps your broker. Uh, so even if Mr. Nobles is telling me, hey, use the TR form, and my client said, no, use the TREC form, and be like, well, I'm going to have to use the TREC form. Uh, and you wouldn't think that, right? You'd yeah. think it'd be the broker that would say, well, you know, because you got to do what your broker says. But um, yeah, the client trumps it. Um, but yeah, the, the TREC the form has a very minimum amount, it's very, very basic. Um, so the seller's disclosure is not a guarantee or a warranty. That's a big thing. It's basically just what they know about the property. It's not guaranteeing any of that information or warranting any of that information. Um, it's, yeah, again, responsibility for disclosure is the seller, not the agent. So the Texas property code, more on the seller's disclosure. Uh, most of the items listed on the seller's disclosure are gonna be about physical condition. There's not gonna be a whole lot of, um, like psychological or anything like that. It's mostly physical condition of the property. This is wrong, this was working, this is wrong, or everything is fully working. Um, but liability, the problem with it is that liability accrues if seller fails to disclose anything material, which means we need, we are liable if he, if he fails to disclose something material. So when you get your, get your client this form, you're going to want to tell him, fill it out to the best of your ability. Any material facts must go in there unless you want a lawsuit. Let's throw around that. I don't, like, I don't like throwing around a lawsuit very much, but is going to save your client money, you know. Um, also remember that this is, we talked about this in the contracts class, that if you don't have the uh, seller's disclosure filled out, then the other party can actually terminate the contract at any point up to closing. Yep. So you can walk into the close, like into the closing room at the title company, sit down at the table, and if you close before the other party, you can do your whole closing, walk out, the other party can come in and go, actually, we're good. And the whole transaction is called off because yep. you've never turned in the seller's disclosure. Yep. And if you turn it in after, like late, then you get seven days past whatever date you turn it in. You get seven days after that that they can back out anything. Which is why we like to always do it before we even list the property. Because yep. if I get a contract in, I send it back to you. They don't want an auction period, and that's a really good selling point. But I already accepted your contract, and then I go fill out a seller's disclosure and give it to you that afternoon. You still have seven days to terminate the contract. For, like. Because I gave you a seller's disclosure after we weren't in the contract. So you would have done everything. Else. Yeah. And so, yeah. So it's best just to, that's what we like to do all in first. And that's also why it's so important is even if your client, you know, isn't scared by a lawsuit, it could be scared by, you know, just lose it all the transactions. Like they just walk out. Like lose <laughs> you just lose, you'll lose the transaction. Yeah. So. so, what about this, though? What, what about just raw land? Do you need a seller's disclosure for that? You do it's not going to have a whole lot on it of course but you still need a seller disclosure even for raw land but if you're not living on the property then how can you give a seller's disclosure well think of it this way it's there's nothing raw land there's nothing out there really right so you don't really have to fill out anything important you just need to have a seller's disclosure saying hey this is what we know about the property but even if you didn't live there, uh, it's pretty easy to fill out a form for raw land. What would you typically say on raw land up there? Like, just too much I mean, you might say stuff like large trees, maybe a pond, just stuff just like that. Okay. It could also be, it, that could also be exempt for a lot of reasons. So you don't know, have to fill it out because a lot of our land won't have, you won't have the ability to, yeah. yeah. Yep. So there is some exemptions as well. But, no, um, I think in the, the unapproved property contract and in the, I think it's just the unapproved property. There's like not, there's not a spot for a seller's disclosure. Like you can't determine it. 
if you can do one, and it's usually it's good to do one because again, it's nice to just have one to cover your ass. But yeah, but like on the contract, there's not a spot for it. Technically. Yeah. yeah. Um, so material fact or material means anything physical, any physical defects, uh, as well as non tangible facts or psych psychological stigmas. Yes, psycho psychological sti stigmas. I'm fumbling words. Um, yeah, so we're going to go into more detail on that too. But here, if, can y'all see this? Well, do we need to close the blinds? Like, yeah. maybe lower a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Kind of close, 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 close. Just to see that. It was, it was cloudy and now the sun's coming out, so. That's a lot better. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. I pulled up the contract just to think, just to look at it again, but like for unimproved property and stuff like that, there's not a seller's disclosure like as far as a separate form, but there is a section that just says, unless otherwise disclosed, seller has no knowledge of, and it's like flooding on the property, and it's just like a list of six things. Exactly. And that is your seller's disclosure, is that unless you list otherwise, you are disclosing that none of this has happened to the property. So that's kind of your, because there's no house to be like the foundation's bad and then this is that and whatever. So that's your seller's disclosure. You're just saying there's been no flooding, there's been none of this. And if there is, instead of having a seller's disclosure, you just have to list it in the contract. The next question. Mm -hmm. So this is the TREC uh, seller's disclosure. As I was saying, it's very, very basic. It's not going to have a whole lot of information. Yeah. Basically, just kind of yes and no on certain parts. Um, you can see here, are the seller oh, is aware of any of the above turn items that are not working condition. So it's basically, are you the seller aware of blank, blank, and blank that are not working or is working? Um, and so you would, you would write yes or no on those. Um, it keeps going, same thing. That's electrical systems, ceilings, exterior walls, termite damage, all that stuff. Uh, like I was saying, the, the, the Texas Realtors form is way more detailed and that's probably what you'll be using unless your client tells you to use this one. Uh, it's just very basic. And then of course, they'll be signing at the end. Uh, so Kessler versus Fanning, that was a court case that came together. Um, it, was, it was basically, is something a fact or an opinion? So if you, if you go before a judge and a judge is trying to figure out if what you said was a fact or opinion, these are the kind of questions that he will be asking himself. Uh, was it a statement specific or was it vague? Was it a very vague statement or was it basic? Um, sometimes you want to emphasize a fact and other, other times you're going to want to push to the side of opinion. Um, like I was saying, there's a balance between that. You might need to find it. So, a situation where you would want to emphasize a fact would be like, uh, we know for a fact that there's foundation issues or something. It's in the seller's disclosure. It's in we the got seller. it and it says this. <laughs> it says it. Yeah. There is foundation issues. Yeah. Or something you would want to err on the side of opinion. That one's a little more difficult because opinions can be a lot of different things. Um, but some things you don't want it to sound like a fact because if you say it, if you say it in a way that sounds like a fact, like we were saying earlier, yeah. it can it can be it can get you in trouble. I know statements you get into a lot of trouble with contracts and stuff like that. Where if you if you're really vague about the like what's in the contract, that's not great because like if it says you have ten days for an option period, and you don't say you have ten days for an option period, like you're you're kind of like ah hey, you got some time and we'll figure it out that's being vague and that's a problem where you can actually get in trouble for being too vague and not being specific enough. Yeah. If there's stuff listed in the contract, anything in the contract is a fact. So even if the other party puts it in and it's like they put in that they have this thing or whatever, it is fact because it's in the contract. So you can disclose that and you're supposed to be very specific when you disclose that sort of stuff. But again, if you're just kind of walking around the house looking at stuff, you're not expecting, you don't know what's going on, that's when you need to be vague. But when it comes to contracts and stuff, you want to be as specific as possible. And that's also where I, I know when you're filling out like the um, condition of the property as is, and we have like as is or as is as long as the seller at their expense does blank, blank, and blank. You don't want to just put fix windows because what does that mean? Whereas if you put, like I think in one of the examples we had in that class was like replace the four fog windows in the kitchen. Like that is very specific. 
And so you don't want to be vague and just be like, paint. And it's like, you want to repaint? What, is that, what does that mean? Like the whole house, a room? Like, what is this? like that's, you know, you don't want to get stuck in those situations of being too vague. So that's mm -hmm. where you want to be specific. I actually had a time where I had to be specific saying that we wanted the fridge that's in the kitchen, not in the garage. Yeah. I had to stipulate that in the contract. Yeah. Like, hey, we will pay you X amount for fridge located in the kitchen. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. The contracts, yes, you want to be very factual. And as you said, other times you're going to want to be vague. Um, another question that the judge might ask is that the, did the parties possess the same knowledge? If one party knew more than the other party, then he would think that they would have an unfair advantage. So uh, he would like to rule against that. And also if it was past rather than future conditions. Um, so if I knew for a fact that the house flooded a few years back, what can I expect to probably happen in the future? that and or it's going to flood again. So, uh, yeah. So if, if I know for a fact it did, it's probably going to, you can probably predict it'll flood at some point again. Uh, so those are going to be questions that they'll ask. Is it a fact or an opinion? All right, so material facts. We've gone over this, we're going over it again. Um, so a material fact is any fact that is relevant to a person making a decision. We talked about that yesterday. If it's going to affect the, my decision on buying that property, then it's a material fact. Um, and that's in the language of real estate. It's actually written by a layman, I guess would be the word. He's not actually practicing, but uh, I guess he knows law. So, yeah, anything that'll affect me in actually making a decision on the property is a material fact. Uh, so, there's physical material facts. Um, that relates to negative conditions on the property. So advise buyers not to rely solely on the seller's disclosure. Never rely solely on the seller's disclosure. As we told you before, they they get their best knowledge of the property, but it's not a guarantee or a warranty. Uh, licensed property inspectors are not warranties too. Um, people think, oh, I got my house inspected. So my home is in great condition. Everything's good. Not exactly. It just means that it was in a good condition when that inspector went out there. <laughs> Justin's actually had times when the inspector just left and then like the stove starts having issues and stuff like that. It just means that during the time of inspection, everything was working properly. Um, And a lot of the times people are going to say something like, hey, I mean, I'm, this is going to be more for resale homes and not new homes. Uh, sometimes they may say, hey, I'm paying $250,000 for a property. It better be perfect. And, so, and sometimes you might have to explain to them, uh, you're buying a house from 1970. It's not going to be perfect. And, um, so it, it's not going to be like a 2021 built house. Okay. You might have to explain that to them. Uh, and then residential service companies, that, that's basically just home warranty. They just don't want to say warranty because it makes it sound a little scarier. So they put residential service companies, but those companies must register with Trey, the Texas Real Estate Commission. Uh, material facts, there could be tile issues. Uh, with the property, and there's different types and quality of title. Um, there's also an abstract of title, which we've gone over in title insurance. We've gone over in a previous class. Um, you might need to pull out an abstract of title, which is basically just a title search. Uh, there's standard coverage and exceptions to title issues, and there's also additional coverages, such as endorsements, which will be available for personal property that your client might request. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm just thinking said, out loud. I just read it. This is, I just read it loud. Okay. Uh, so endorsements, uh, your client might ask you to do something like that. It's basically just it's, it's coverage for their personal property. 
All right, so survey issues. Um, so survey issues, it, they're exempted from standard tile policy. Survey issues, they're exempted from standard tile policy. Uh, registered professionals and land surveyors, they're still human, right? They can get stuff wrong. I have a house right now, or Aiden does, that uh, the, the survey was not done properly and there's a good chunk of land missing that they were under contract for. So they were under contract for two acres, but in reality, what they're getting is one point something acres. So uh, apparently it turned into a huge mess and it fell through. Uh, that can happen. Uh, so it's, it's a survey is going to be completed before inspection. Justin actually told me at one time that he had a, a client that went and got an inspection, an appraisal, and everything else done on the property before they had even put a contract in. And you are never supposed to do that. He, he walked up to Justin and said, all right, he, he said, all right, so let's go get an inspection. We'll get an inspection going and all that. And he said, oh, no, 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 I've already got it. I've got it all right here. It's like, what? I was, I'm confused. You already have all that stuff doing? You are not supposed to do that. <laughs> It's like, it's like me going over to your house and basically inspecting your property, but I have no interest. I'm not actually going to buy the property. Would you want me to do yeah. stuff like that? No. Um, so it's going to be completed before closing, but under contract. Um, in Texas, let's say, well, so it also could be something like if there's an easement. Like they, this person might tell me, hey, I have an easement on this property, but if you go and look up and it turns out they don't and you were trespassing that whole time. Very dangerous in Texas, especially, and I'll say this multiple times, if you see purple paint painted anywhere on a tree or a pole or anything like that, you don't go on that property. <laughs> it's a very little known fact and it's still a rule. It's an old yeah. school rule. Uh, if you see a purple paint, it basically means you're free game. If you trespass, they will shoot you. Yeah. So you're putting your life at risk, especially in Texas. Uh, if you ever pull up to a property and you see that, you're going to show that property. You don't know who's out there. I mean, one of the people that live at the house may know that you're going out there, but then your grandma might not, and she might be sitting on the porch with a shotgun. <laughs> so. I was doing a show once where we had, we were out there showing some land and a truck pulled up with two ladies in it and they were, who are you? What are you doing out here? And I'm like, I'm Travis Clark from Nova Scotia here. I'm out here showing some, showing some property to this, these are our clients. Why are you out here? Because this property is for sale. And so I set up a show to come out here. Well, my brother owns this property. Well, then you should know that he's selling this property. <laughs> That's why we're out here. Like. They, they just had no idea, so to them, we were just wandering around on their oh, property. Yep. But like, she didn't realize that it was her brother-in-law or whatever that owned the property that he's selling it. And they live on the track right behind it, and they just saw people wandering around and were wondering what was going on. It was like, yeah, it was, yeah, so it was very, very careful. Phone, taking a video the whole time as we were talking, and I was like, here's my card. Like, we're, <laughs> I'm supposed to be here. Like, I don't, I like, I don't understand. Some people are very suspicious. Yeah. Very suspicious. So, yeah, you ever see purple paint? Do not go on the property. You're putting your life and your clients life at yeah. risk I mean, it's actually it's it's an old school rule as i was saying but it's not exactly on the book i mean it's on the books but it's did you go buy it though do what that they go buy it they, they go, go buy it here that yeah for players it's, it's a very little known rule so are you talking about like really out of the rural areas or just like oh yeah, yeah. Oh, okay you're talking about out there yeah, okay. yeah, I mean, you, you can't. Like, you can't put. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Well, I don't <laughs> even like next to farmlands that are still like you know it's property, but it's just like oh, I thought you had yeah. like, someone's out there paying for. No, no. <laughs> yeah, who's doing this? You're coming <laughs> on like 0.58. You're like, here's my purple line, bro. It's like a marker. Yeah, I got. Yeah, it's basically like a college station. Yeah, and I'm walking like right. It's a purple on my apartment complex. Yeah. Now you're just tagging buildings. Yeah. Point. Um, so yeah, that's a very little known fact. But survey issues for surveys are done uh, before closing, not after. And now we get to the fun part. 
stigmatized properties. Um, so a stigmatized property is can it can be real or imagined. That's right. Imagined. I can imagine something up and it can stigmatize a property. If I go and tell my friend, let's say it's a drug house or I'm on drugs or something one night and I, I say I see something and then I tell my friend, hey, I saw something in my house, maybe my house is on it. Then he tells me, they tell me. It just keeps going, keep going. And now everyone knows that my house is haunted when in reality <laughs> it's not haunted. <laughs> but it's known as stigmatized. Yeah. So uh, get this. You cannot disclose things such as HIV, AIDS, or suicide on a property. You but can't. It, you cannot. But if the house is stigmatized or known to be haunted, you must disclose it. Right. That's a little. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. You think? Yeah. Because it, it's real imagined events, but those things that you just mentioned were, were all. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So. Wouldn't that kind of fall under that religious thing that we were talking about yesterday? It could. Yes, ma'am. What? And you couldn't disclose that information. You could not. If it was a, well, see, ghosts aren't, I would say ghosts aren't exactly religious necessarily. It's just a belief that people have. That, that's a, that's a, that's a tough area to try and explain. Um, but if it's something related to an actual religion, then yes. But if it if it's just if it's just known to be a haunted house, then yeah, you would have to disclose that. But if it was like like uh, like what was the, the devil religion like Satanism. Satanism. Yeah. So if like, someone was like actually practicing Satanism in there, you yeah. Got, it's a perfect thing to ask. If someone was actually pra practicing Satanism in a house and. I know about it. Mm -hmm. Technically, I can't disclose that, correct? Because it's religious. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a tough, it's a tough area. So like my attorney said today in the meeting, uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. You just hope you're not in that situation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you just hope so. Uh, we were talking about being vague or being specific. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Most of the time, the answer is going to be it depends. Um, if they're practicing rituals and things to that nature, it's really that you know. Well, you know. well, you well know. no, it comes back to this point, and here's where it comes back to. Like my attorney stated in the meeting today, what did he tell y'all, Travis and uh, Andy Stephan? He says it's better to what than not what. Better to and disclose, disclose <laughs> than and not disclose, yeah. because if you end up if you disclose. Oh, okay then that's going to end up, that's going to cover you, okay? Because like he said in the meeting was, when you're dealing with disclosure, okay, as long as you're being honest and truthful and upfront, it's very difficult for it to come back and bite you, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. I want to counter that point, though, by saying you can't exactly walk into a house and go, oh, by the way, the owners of this place are working. Correct. You can't. There are uh, correct. fair housing laws and discrimination laws yes. and stuff like that, and that's what we're talking about with AIDS and HIV is like, that's don't talk thing. about that. Yeah, that's that's just just there should there should be a reason they would know it in the first place. Like you, there should be a reason they walk in and be like, I heard this person had a like. That's not gonna walk to a house. No. I heard HIV. That's that's not gonna happen. But if it's something you find out, like if the you know if it's listed on the on the MLS service or whatever, like for you or whatever, you still like you're not supposed to. Do that. I will know it in the room and sell you an HIV house. What? For example, I mean, for example, example. Say, the house you know, <laughs> say for example that you know Stephen, our buddies, okay, you know that he has a illness, not just HIV, but a illness. So that's protected under HIPAA, okay. Now, you cannot go. Could you go disclose his information? Well, if he tells you yeah. that he has it, you go tell you fine. Yeah, he has this. There's not going to be so much of a criminal thing. It's going to be more of a civil thing yeah. between you and him because you're disclosed his personal stuff. Mm -hmm. But it cannot stop Giovanni from purchasing the house. And if it does, now you're in trouble. Yeah. If you see what I'm saying. So just the information of it. If it, if it 
can mess the cell up. If, if, they, if, they, if it affects their decision on actually buying the property. Correct. So you have to make certain that you watch what you say, how you say it. Yeah. Uh, if somebody, for example, one of the biggest ones, have you talked about um, sex offenders? Yeah, no, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, we'll get there and then you, you'll see kind of what we're talking about. Sex I think we talked about that in my class too. I don't know if you're going. Did you talk about that? Yeah, we talked about that. I thought that came in my class. The, the key thing with sex offenders, this happens sometimes. Say, for example, Caroline, you go and you talk to, to Wyatt here. He's a, he's a realtor. Okay. And you're looking to buy a house. All right. And y'all want to go look at, say, Travis's house. All right. Well, you get online and you do a search because you're trying to be proactive. And you find out that the person that lives in that house is a sex offender. Okay. Well, you go over there and you tell your client, oh yeah, this house, it's a sex offender. He lives there. Okay. Well, the problem is, is the sex offender was Stefan who's moved out. He was releasing the property and he's moved out two years ago. Okay. Well, the thing is, is if you just told him the person that lives here is a sex offender, what's he going, well, who are you going to think is a sex offender? I don't know. I he don't work here. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Just gonna be, so you slander the stencil away from yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do y'all kind of see how you got to be careful? Yeah. Okay. You don't, you never want to say, if you want to help your client, mm -hmm. say he has a family and kids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine to tell him, here's a resource that you can go look at. Mm -hmm. So here's a place you can go look at. But I'm just giving you the resource, I'm giving you the tool. What you do with it, it's a that's him. Yeah. And that's, that's something we talked about in my class too. Was like it, it mentioned that like it's something that you can't disclose is that there's a sex offender or whatever. And I'm like, but don't because it's not it's not worth it because the chance that you can slander somebody's name, even if you get they that a Travis Stall is a sex offender and lives in that neighborhood, there might be two, there might be another one. Yeah. But, you know, it's like you never know, and so it's just you don't want it to come back as well. Like there's slander somebody's name in, in Little Old Navasota. You know where Navasota's at? Little Old Navasota, right over here. There's five ladies that have my mother's same name yes. there's five there's five in this Jeez. in the small town of little old Minnesota that have her same name well one of them was convicted of theft so my mother always when she'd go to the bank she had to tell them that's not me that's the other person <laughs> but you see kind of here's that that's a, yeah <laughs> now the lane here i'm three yeah <laughs> i'm like <a> three yeah <laughs> so you got to kind of watch yourself when you're going through these just to cover yourself all yeah, right so i know one thing that but, uh, too is like i haven't mentioned my class like i wouldn't even give them like here is where you can look that stuff up Mm -hmm. I would just say there's a resource out there. Yeah, you can you look can it up online. Cause, it up. Yeah, because you just the, the less you get into if you if you go, you can look it up right here. And yeah. all it shows when they look it up is that it's this person. Yep. It can still get traced back. Well, they gave me the how to do it. Whereas you if give you them the wrong like, address. Yeah. Wrong yeah. Website, yeah. And so that's why it's, it's easy just to be like, if you want to Google search it, there's plenty of resources you can use to yeah. that stuff. I would, advise, I would advise you do it. Yep. <laughs> it's like, but I'm not going to tell you. There's a reason that I've had the past almost two months I've had legal people in here in the <laughs> office. Is it because the fact is that, you know, that they just, I want a bunch of lawyers coming in here talking about people. No, it's, this is a very sue happy field. And it is. You see what I'm saying? Very and they love to sue. Now, is that is that a reason Travis should say, quit? Yeah, no, don't let no. that scare you. Yeah. Yeah. No, not at all. You can get sued for walking down the street. Exactly. You can get sued for driving home. Yeah. You, can, you can get sued for anything. So don't but let it be. Just, just cover, your yeah, you cover yourself. Cover make yourself. sure you're good. But the key thing is, and that's where I come into play. Because if there's a problem, Travis or Stefan, they come to me and I'm like, okay, I wouldn't do that. I would do it this way. Yeah. Or vice versa. Uh, and then if I don't know, I'm going to say, hey, Carwin, go talk to my attorney. He'll he'll tell you what to do, and then we kind of lead y'all in those and he'll situations. Say, it depends. Yeah, that's yeah, like, a lot of times. Every time. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you right now. It just depends. I know, like they used to have like a. I don't think they still do like the the realtors like legal the hotline or whatever. Yeah, that's a waste and of money. You, you you call it, wait for two and a half hours, and then they go, like, well, it depends. Sometimes. You know what? Oh, thanks. This <laughs> like, cool. I'm glad I waited for two hours. Yeah. So, Mr. Pete, we got a question here. I have a question. So, like, what if you want to disclose that there was a sex offender living in that property, right? So then later on, like, the family or 
the buyers find out find out about it and like they try to sue you for it. They can't sue you. Can't sue you. Okay. Because the fact of the matter is, in that situation, is is you do not have mandatory disclosure. You uh, can tell them and it's recommend it, but you don't want to end up like I said is you don't want to get in that situation yeah. where you go and I say because see the thing about sex offenders yeah. the sex offender has to actually register oh. if that person's like I said back here so Travis is renting his house out he rents it out to Stephen okay Stephen went and registered like he's supposed to I live at one two three Main Street but after a year Stephen House now moved out but did not register with the county. The county still has it as he lives at 123 Main Street. He moves back into his house. Guess what ends up happening? Now, when people go, if you say, oh, well, there's a sex offender, you're now slandering him. Yes, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You kind of see where I'm going with that. It's, like, it, it's not in your like job description to disclose. We're actually it's exempt from that rule. Yeah, so like, it's something you here. We're not like required. It's not part of, like, when I signed a listing contractor uh, representation agreement, it doesn't say that I have to disclose that there's a sex offender in the area. So they can't come back to me for being like, he didn't do his job. I was like, that's not my job. So, <laughs> so, so and, <laughs> and another thing is, is, let me add to that as well, Giovanni. Say, for example, that I see Miss Coleman out there. Okay, Miss Coleman's out there. She has a family. She has kids. She's got a husband. She's, she's got all this stuff. And she's got little kids. Well, if I'm showing her property, I'm probably going to tell her, Miss Coleman, I think it would probably be best that, especially if I kind of think I'm seeing somebody there, I'm going to probably push her to go do her own due diligence. Yeah. And I'm going to say, you might want to double check that area. Yeah, look on this you website. may want to, well, not get that website, but you want to kind of do your due diligence. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or call the police station. They can uh -huh. kind of help you. Because they do that. You can't call the police department, not 911. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, not 911. <laughs> but you can call their, their normal phone number and you can say, can you tell me if there's any sex offenders in this area? And then they'll lead you to the right place. I only do that if there's little children involved. Okay, even teenagers. I still kind of, if there's a family, I'm still going to kind of, you might want to do this. But I'm not mandated to actually go out there and actually, are you a sex offender? <laughs> yeah. Okay, not, not going to do that. Okay. Um, but yes, it's like if it's college guys, y'all saying y'all written a place together. Uh -huh. I'm not really going to be like, don't need to go look at that. That's y'all's business, okay? But if there's little children, okay, I, I'm going to push you to that situation where if there's a single mom with little children. I'm going to say, you might want to look at this spot, okay? Uh, but again, you want to be careful. It comes back to like when you refer to things. Say, Travis, if I walk up to Travis and say, hey, uh, I need an inspector. Travis, can you ever give me one inspector? Nope. If you do, what happens? I get in trouble because if something happens with that one, it's directly my referral. So it's directly my fault for giving it to you, basically. That's right. So if I go and he gives me Wyatt, and Wyatt comes out and misses that there's foundation issues, well, Travis told me to use him. So it's your fault, Travis. And then guess who's going to turn back one? Back on me as his broker because I did not tell him he needs to live, at least get three of them. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So you got to kind of give a recommendation. Okay, so in those situations is you got to be very careful when you're doing these things, if that makes sense. Okay, everybody online good? I, I can't see them. <laughs> good? Get a lot of thumbs up. Thumbs up? We're good. <gasps> Miss Vita! <laughs> is that Miss Kenna? McKenna? There's Miss Corey. I have a question. Yes. So as an agent, you cannot disclose that there's possibly a sex offender there, but in the seller's disclosure, even though it's not part of the house, could mm -hmm. the seller disclose that kind of information? If the seller wants to, yes. But let me tell you, if I was representing you, Ms. Vita, I would tell you don't. <laughs> because of the fact of the matter is it still puts that situation that you might be defaming a person. Yeah. You may be slandering their name. So in those situations, because we all know how quick the court system works, right? Really fast, right? Oh, okay. Oh yeah. When, and one day I'll be next. Yeah, real quick. Yeah. So Miss Vita, say for example that you were to tell Miss Corey, for example, 
you tell Corey, you say, Corey, uh, there's a sex offender. His name's Wyatt Campbell. He lives next door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you, know, you, go, again. <laughs> you go put that on there. Well, guess what? Miss Vita, the person that you put down as Wyatt Campbell is not actually the Wyatt Campbell that you meant. You've now slandered his name. He now turns around and sues you. Yeah. Okay. So, so in that situation is you got to be very careful on how you're going to do that. I'm going to tell you, don't do it. Okay. But now if you know for a fact now, Miss Vita, that the person next door, say it was this Wyatt, for example, he's lived there for 20 something years. Okay. And you called the police department and all that, and they still confirm that he is an active sex offender. If you want it to, you could, but what I'm going to recommend you do is maybe end up telling your agent. So you tell me, I would then probably relay that to Giovanni here, who's the other agent, say, hey, FYI, you might want to tell your client that there's possibly a sex offender next door. So they need to do their due diligence. And then at that point, I've covered my bases and I put the liability now on who? Can sex offenders depreciate the property value? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Tremendously. Wow. Tremendously. It's, well, it's another type of it, right? It's another type of stigma. Like it's a stigma. It is a stigma. Yeah. It is a stigma. Because I, well, let's just answer that question. All of you online. If if your answer is yes, thumbs up. If your answer is no, put thumbs down. How many of y'all want to live next door to a sex offender? <laughs> There you go. Look at all this. See? Yeah, yeah. See? There you go. So right there, if y'all don't want to live by a sex offender, what's going to end up happening? You're not going to do it. So nobody wants to do it. So in that situation, what happens? Prices are going to drop. Okay. So you want to be very careful in regards to that, especially if you have children. Okay. Especially if you have children, you're not going to want to be there. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Good questions, aren't they good? So, so you, can't, about you can't disclose if there's a sex offender in, in next door, but think about this. I have a client and I end up, I sell this uh, client this house and he's like, wow, it's it's super cheap and it's super huge, but it's actually haunted. And I don't tell him that it's haunted. He can actually, if he finds out later on, he can actually come that back. You knew? If I knew. Okay. Yeah. Then he like, could actually. Like it was some haunted stuff you're never told about, and like let that go on that can't that can't come back. Yeah, 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 I was I wasn't aware. Okay, yeah. I wasn't aware. But if I knew and I sold him this house and it was cheap and big for the price, you know, um, he can actually come back and sue me for times three damages because I didn't tell him that there was a ghost in the house. But I can't tell him that there's a sex offender next door. Yeah, isn't that crazy? How do you real quick? The question: Did you talk to them about murders yet? No, uh, no we're, that's, that's, that's next. Like, okay. Do you want to slam Are you finished with this one? <laughs> um, no. Because okay. I do want to talk to them about that real life example I actually have. I can finish up the slide real quick. Finish that up and then I want to talk to them about so that. One per, uh, so one person's stigma could be another person's major selling point. I mean, someone might want to live in a house with a ghost. I mean, do you? I'm all in all the time. So yeah, what? Yeah. Only a Satanist would want to live in a house with ghosts. Probably. <laughs> Wait. Probably. You got a question. Wait, what about if that house, because I know fire fire was a thing in many, many places. Mm -hmm. Don't know if sellers are willing to want to know if that house has a history of burning down just because it happened to me before. Like there was a fire that happened right across from where I used to live. And then new seller bought that house knowingly that that house was burned down. Do you have to disclose that? No, you, that would be you absolutely would have to disclose that. And uh, not you as an agent, the so seller. That would be the seller. That would be the seller yeah. disclosure. Yes. If a house burns down or floods. Yeah. See, in Houston, what's the problem in Houston? You all got relatives in Houston? Uh huh. What happens in Houston? It floods. Houston itself is under sea. Yes. So, Houston itself is a swamp. And guys, let me tell you. So, I one time, I one time went out a while back, went to a client's uh, house in Houston, and uh, the individual they had a house downtown Houston. Okay, and if you know downtown Houston, how are prices down there? 
Very expensive. Okay. Uh, their house was close to eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They ended up they had water all the way to the top level and halfway into their second level of their home. They lost everything. And guess what? Their insurance ended up did not cover flood insurance. So guess what? They lost everything. The house had to be gutted. Yeah. That eight hundred something thousand dollar house, they only got thirty thousand dollars from a person that bought it. Yeah. They lost their entire assess or their asset yeah. for their retirement because they were going to resell it and then move up north. Mm -hmm. Lost it all. So That's now they're they're like in their seventies, living in an apartment complex. That's sad, man. Okay, but yes, to come back to your question, flood or fire. fire has to be disclosed. So, as I said, a person's stigma can be another person's major selling point. Um, Justin told me, he said, uh, they, there was a house with a cemetery across the road and to sell it, he said, uh, quiet neighbors across the street <laughs> yeah. on the sign. That's your marketing way. I thought that's that was lovely. hilarious. Um, In yeah, real estate, so, you gotta be creative. Yeah, yeah. that's hilarious. And that was a good, that was, that's, it made you laugh, right? Uh, <laughs> and so there's HUD guidelines and Texas law regarding death disclosure is it, it's they're different in each state but uh, for Texas like we said you can't disclose HIV AIDS um, or suicide but you must disclose ghosts imagine that out of suicide. Must have all right, so, <laughs> so now we're talking more about psychological stigmas. And the psychological stigma is uh, properties that are stigmatized by happenings on the property or within the vicinity of the property. Yes, sir. So before you get started, I want to kind of jump in. This is going to lead to your, your lecture into this part. So when you are with me, first off, first, actually, I'm going to go with this one first. I'm going to help you. Have I ever in my years of working with you and you work with me, have I ever given you a normal transaction? Not a single one. <laughs> Does Justin ever get normal transactions? Oh, God, no. Never. Not, not ever. Never. I get the most craziest transactions. And then he gives them to me. And then I give them to Stephen. <laughs> and then Stephen gives them to me. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And then I give them to Abe. We'll pass them down the table. Just keep going. Yeah, we'll, we'll work it out. It'll get sold eventually. Yeah, yeah. it'll get sold eventually. <laughs> But what happened was I actually got called out to uh, Montgomery County, out by, you know where I'm talking about, Montgomery. And uh, it was in the, wood, in the woods, okay? It's like you're going towards Huntsville. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got called out and they said, you know, we were wanting to do a listing and uh, we're not going to be there, but we want you to go look at the property. We put a combo lock on it. You go on in, take a picture, do what you need to do and get me a price. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I'll go out there. I can't remember who I took with me. I don't know if I took you or somebody with me, but I took somebody with me out on the property. Well, it's been a while. It's been a long time. Probably been at least three years now. <laughs> we went out to the property. Get there. First off, you're in no man's land. You're like in the in the redneck part of <laughs> Montgomery County. Okay. And uh, I get to the property, and the road is long, only big enough for one car. Okay, and I was in my truck. And if y'all remember my truck, my truck was huge. Okay, uh, and so I take my truck out and uh, pull up in it, which I had to have it because I had to go up this dirt road. But I get to it, it's a double wide trail, and I'm like, okay. So of course I carry just because when I'm out in that kind of stuff, I always have a gun on me. So I had my gun on me. Walked into the trailer house, open it up. I'm like, this is a decent trailer house. It actually looks nice. Looks good. Start going around, walk around. One of my interns that was with me ended up said, uh, Mr. Nobles, can you come here? And I was like, what? And I'm on this side of the house. He's on this side. And I said, what's up? So I start walking over there and he's just like, hell. And he's like, what's that? I walk over in the bedroom, the master bedroom. I am not kidding you, was a blood stain about that big. And it was just on the ground and I was like uh and he's like is it what I think it is and I was like yeah so one thing I'll tell you is you don't do this unless you know what you're doing you pull back the carpet if you want to see if it's really blood or not 
pull the carpet back because the carpet will stain through and it goes to concrete and will stain concrete. So I pulled it back. And guess what ended up happening? It was stained to the concrete. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in that situation, I immediately contacted he took the rest of the person. Photos. I did take I photos. <laughs> so I took a lot of photos. Um, but I have a history. I mean, I've got, I've worked in, in law enforcement, or not law enforcement, but I worked in uh, the legal field of criminal justice and things like that. So I kind of am used to that kind of stuff. So I knew what to do. I'm a private investigator and all that. So I kind of know what I'm doing. So it didn't scare me. But I pulled it back and immediately I was like, yeah, this is, this is blood. So I ended up, I put it all back. When you turned around to explain, was he gone? He was already outside. He was, oh, he was, <laughs> after I said it was blood, he, he was gone. He's on so, the so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, But I pulled it back, and when I saw that, well, I immediately called the person that called me out, and I was like, what the hell happened here? Like, I need to know what's going on. Well, come to find out, it wasn't what everybody thought. It wasn't a shooting or anything. The person ended up that was in that room was an elderly individual that ended up she died but before she died she had vomited up blood mm -hmm. and there was a ton of just blood and they never fully cleaned it and then they had to come out there a little bit <laughs> yeah. oh man so what ended up happening was it wasn't a shooting or anything but the thing is is like i immediately told them you got to clean that stuff up you got to take all that out and clean it because if anybody walks in that house and sees that, what's going to happen? Yeah, yeah, sure. They're gone. Okay? And they're going to immediately assume what? Criminal activity in this neighborhood. Okay? So in those situations, yeah. is you got to be aware of those things, and that's why as a real estate agent, you always got to put your eyes on the property. Because people in these day and times, Mr. Travis, Mr. Uh, Stephen here can tell you, you look online at houses. And they're beautiful. Beautiful. You open the door, what do they look like, Mr. Grossman and Mr. Travis? All I can say is people are really good at Photoshop. Photoshop is a thing. Yeah. And they use it. Yeah. yeah. I have walked into houses and I'm like, these pictures must have been when this house was first built. Because there is no way this is the pictures from the recent. They're not. I mean, some of them have been beautiful online. Then you actually go there and it is. Yeah. That was yeah. the house that like my parents moved into when I was still in high school when we were moving houses. It was like the photos online, it looked like it was a brand new house. We got there and it was like, no, this thing's old. It's yeah. it's yep. been built. Yep. <laughs> they definitely and a lot of places you'll see too. Like we went up there really nice on the house with Dana for that one time. Yep. It looks super nice in photos and even like just standing outside, you're like, this place is awesome. When you walk inside and like all the windows are like peeling off, like the whole thing is just like a fall out of the house. Like yep. walking around you find all these little things, you're like, this is this is gonna take a lot of work, but this doesn't look at it. Real quick, let's let's teach them something. Pull up, if you don't mind, pull up a box brownie. I'm gonna show you all something, guys and gals. Every one of you, I'm gonna show you what real estate agents do. Oh yeah, usually. You know, like the dogs. Yeah. The dogs look nice from the outside. Then we go in. All the brownie grays. It's the smell. It's so yeah. It used to be so fun when it was like red and yellow. And they had to play yeah. yeah. I, I swear, it's like they grew up with the generation of kids yeah. that they were feeding. Yeah. Like, yeah. They're all yeah. middle aged. Yeah. 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 All right. So if you kind of look, it's going to kind of flip through these, but you can kind of tell. Yeah, click on. There we go. See how it looks vacant? They put furniture. Man, it looks good. What? Go to the next one. Wait, wait. So this go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. That's not this one. This is the before. Yeah. Here's your after. Yeah. Look at this. They took yeah, all the dishes really and all that stuff. Yep. Yeah. Made it look nice. <laughs> Day, night. That's a drawing. That's them actually putting it and making it look like a real house. So it's built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's this one's not even been done. Yeah. Ugly. That's what it's done. Made it look like, like this. <laughs> yeah. So you will walk into houses, see how he does a floor plan. That's just drawing. It's like all made it to real estate shows. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes, look at this. Can they change it? Yep. Yeah, my, my mom's one of my mom's apart, or, uh, houses we went and looked at the same sort of thing. Like looking at the photos online, it's like you get this photo, and then the next photo is this photo, and you can tell like it's not. Yep. Something's yep. off. Like yeah, it doesn't look great. Right. <laughs> like, yep. You can kind of just tell, but like every they put both photos up, but every photo was like what looking unfurnished and then furnished. Yeah. But it wasn't real furniture. It's like yeah, you walk in and it's just vacant. 
Yeah. Yeah. But the reason they do this is for what purpose? And check out what the price. price. Twenty-four yeah, it's twenty-four bucks for them to do that for you. Twenty-four dollars. But look, but what? But what's the difference? How many of y'all want to go to a vacant-looking room? Yeah. No, you want to get the nice-looking room, right? So we Photoshop them in those situations. Okay. This one's a dollar. Now let me show you the difference here. I'll show you the difference. You see this one? I'm glad you went to this one. Yeah. I have had people that literally my parents' house. Their yard is really nice, my parents' is, but the one that was across the street, not really across, across the block and all, their house had just dead, just dirt, yeah. okay? A realtor walked up to my mother one day and said, hey, can I take a picture of your house? And she's like, why? Well, because we're going to Photoshop your house out and put the grass and all in ours so that we can go over there and do that. Yeah. Now, if you do that, you get in trouble. I'm going to say, okay? you're using two different... That's correct, yes. Yeah. But some people will try that to end up making theirs look more enticing. Yeah. It is fine for you to enhance a photo, but you also have to state in your listing that it's been enhanced, okay? You cannot just put this up and end up not stating that it's been, or not has not been enhanced. All the people will. Yes, people do it all the time, but not many people report them. But I kind of can, I've got it down now, I can tell, like I can just tell an agent, I can tell if Giovanni's one of those people or Carol one, I can just tell right off the bat over time as I'm doing business deals. If I see Giovanni's deal, I'm like, oh, yep, that's fake. And I'll tell my client right up to that. He's just enhancing his photos. It's going to be empty inside. It's probably going to look like crap. Plus okay. you're a private investigator, so you know someone's sketch or not. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, but you know, I always say, I always, my, my broker's a private investigator, so I know if somebody's. <laughs> 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 I know this guy. I'll get to the bottom. Yeah. Of this <laughs> so, but yeah, y'all can kind of see. And like I said, they've got all different things up here at the, at the very top under these tabs. They do image enhancing, they do this, virtual stadiums. I, I mean, all these different things they can end up doing. 3D tours for you, everything. And it only costs you, you know, a couple of bucks. Okay. See how they made the difference the there? <laughs> yeah, nice. Make it look more nice and all of this. But again, like I always tell agents, don't allow those things to end up throwing you because a lot of times, as we all know this, things look nice online. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. You ever, you ever done any dating online? Okay. Okay. And they look perfect online, but then when you meet them, it's like, what in the world? When was that photo? Okay. <laughs> Same kind of things happen in real estate. Okay. Same kind of things happen in this in the industry. So. You can see I even added these little lights. Now see, this can get you in trouble because if you look at this pool, no you can't see the lights and there may not be lights. Yeah, but lights, your yeah. clients see this and what are they going to think? Uh, it's, a lit pool. Yeah, it's a lit pool. So when they buy it, there could be problems. Yeah. You see how that happens. Also check for, check for shadows. Yes. I don't, if it's dusk, I feel like that's not the right. Yep. Yeah, it's not going to look like that. Yeah, it's not going to look like that stuff. So. But does that make sense? Like, like for all of you online, online, does that make sense? Like McKenna, Vita, all that, does that make sense to y'all? Good, good, good. All right. Okay, so go ahead and go on and continue. Okay, yeah. So anything in the, even in the vicinity of the property uh, can stigmatize the property. Let's say if there's a shooting or criminal activity right next door. You're probably not going to want to buy in that area. It's like if someone is coming to Bragg College Station and they say, where, where, which of the two uh, cities are they likely going to want to live in? College Station, because yeah. it's nicer, it's newer. Yeah. But if you think about it, is Brian really that bad? Uh, no, but it has a little bit of a stigma to it, doesn't it? <laughs> so um, things like that, and also rezoning drive-by shootings, even pets disappearing or noisy or obnoxious neighbors, if your neighbors are consistently noisy, it's gonna stigmatize that property as well. Because everybody knows about it, right? They're having parties there every night. And pets disappearing, that does happen. It's usually not like you know, like a vampire eating a dog or something. It's, it's just somebody that they see a pure breed dog, they're probably gonna wanna steal it to breed and make money off of that. At least that's what Justin told me. It, yeah, it, it, it happens. They'll, if they'll, they can't spend the money on the breed, so they just go and steal it, and then they, they breed it. Um, so any of those are psychological stigmas that can be on a property. 
And there's also physical stigmas. So psychological stigmas, you can't measure that they're, you know, you can't measure it. A physical stigma is something that you can measure, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's a condition affecting health and safety. It's got impact on property value. Something like asbestos, lead, even EMFs, uh, radon, uh, USTs, uh, which UST, uh, what is it? Oh yeah, underground storage tanks. Yeah. So USTs are underground storage tanks. Like maybe if there was a, uh, maybe if there was a, uh, the property used to be on a gas, <laughs> where a, a gas station used to be and they left the tanks down there, that could be a problem as well. Um, so it's, it's physical stigmas or anything you can measure. You can go in and you can measure EMFs, stuff like that, even meth labs. Uh, you can measure that. You'll know if there's a meth lab next door. <laughs> um, well, even what's absolutely. likely going to be in there? A bunch of chemicals, stuff like that. Well, stuff is even in the air, like even if they go in the, like, you know, they rain out and that lab, and they clean it all out, and the house back, like, stuff, there's still, like, stuff that could be in the air or in the wood. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Any chemicals, they, they'll soak into the wood. Yeah. My wife, growing up, my wife had, uh, like, two houses across the street from her blow up. I thought you were going to say meth labs. No, <laughs> well, like, grow up, like, they blew up randomly. Because so they were meth labs. Who knows what happened there? But I was like, yeah, we all know. This <laughs> is like, yeah. It was probably so it was a sketchy street. It was like, yeah, we all know what happened. <laughs> so that can yeah. stigmatize the property. That can affect how if you're actually going to buy the property or not. Yeah. Um, so again, oh. yeah. Steve, actually, hold on just a minute, because I do want to show you. I know real quick, guys and gals. This guy. I've got I've got to find it real quick because I want to show you all something to actually put this into play. Is it that house we talked about last time? Yep. Oh, the one that was. Yep. I want quick. to kind of pull it up if I can find it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That one's. That's an old, old house. That's like eighteen hundreds. Search it by. Let's say search it by year. We know it was like eighteen ninety something. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll keep looking here in a minute. You keep teaching and I'll pull it up. So there you go, sir. Um, so guidelines for disclosures on stigmatized properties. Uh, is it fact or is it fiction? Uh, some state laws might actually have guidelines. Yep, go ahead. Uh, state laws. They might differ from state to state, but those might uh, give you guidelines on disclosure of stigmatized properties. Uh, materiality, as we talked about before, anything material with the property. And you may need to think if you're going to discuss it with your seller. Now, the Sanche Sanchez and Guerrero court, I'll let y'all Google that if y'all want. Uh, we're not going to really go over that. So Megan's Law, this is what we were talking about with the sex offenders. Uh, it's sad, but we are exempt from the duty to explode, to disclose that. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, you might want to push them towards going to doing their due diligence, like you were saying. Uh, but we can't disclose any sex offenders there. Uh, prohibited disclosures, any protected classes, there's protected classes such as certain, there's certain individuals that you cannot disclose. There's certain things that you cannot disclose. The client's negotiation position, that's a big one. You, know, you can't, you can't actually disclose what position they are in. You're, you're giving up confidential information to everybody else. Um, if I tell someone about my client's negotiating position, I'm giving them more power to make the deal, and I'm diminishing my client's negotiating power in general, just by saying that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're getting close to the time, so. Okay, so misrepresentation, liability. Um, 
the plaintiff must, they must be able to prove under the DTPA, if you are going to be liable for this, they have to prove that the broker made a misstatement or that the broker knew or should have known about the proper, about this statement wasn't accurate. It's like, it, I, there's clearly termites in the wall, but I didn't disclose it because I didn't know, but I should have known because it's obviously that they're there, something like that. Um, so if they can prove that it was a misstatement or that you that you uh, knew or should have known, or maybe if the buyer relied on the statement, and if the buyer was damaged as a result, then you can become liable for said damages. Yep, moving right along, we're almost almost there. Um, so Mr. Moore on liability. Uh, there's an element of reliance. Was the information material inducement? Was, was the information actually going to make up the, uh, the person's mind on to buy the property or not? That's basically what that material inducement means. Uh, eight, agency is not a defense. I can't just say that, hey, I have agency, so I'm protected. Um, it's not a defense. And under DTPA, license should know um, should not be held liable for innocent acts of misrepresentation. So there we have oh, uh, something called errors and omissions. It's basically just a coverage for stuff like that. Um, if I didn't know about something, then I shouldn't be liable for something I didn't know about. Uh, it's that simple. So and, uh, watch what is said. That's a big one. I'm still learning it. And Justin often has to, like I said, he's got to reword my stuff sometimes because you got to watch what you say. Because if you say something wrong, you could end up getting sued. Yep. All right. Key points for this evening. So we went over agency. It's a two-part agreement. Uh, we went over avoiding misrepresentation and the responsibilities to a third party, which is to be fair and honest and disclose material facts. Uh, we went over the seller's disclosure of property condition. Uh, we went over material facts again, uh, the physical condition or title issues or survey issues that could, could arise. Uh, we went over stigmatized properties, which could be psychological, either real or fake, imagined or real. Uh, we're on the key points, we just have the uh, suggestion for brokers and discussion. Okay, so I'm going to stop you here because you're talking about psychological. We're talking about stigmatized. Okay. So now I'm going to take it from here. Okay. So y'all got to all sit there and listen to... Did you find? Yes, I did. Awesome. So you all end up, y'all got to hear Mr. Grossman talk and all, and I know it kind of probably, you know, which is talking kind of doesn't understand it. Let's put it in practice. I want to actually go. put it into practice. Okay. So... Some of you probably have already seen this, some of you have not, okay, but my question, and let me pull up so I can see all my people here online, I wish I could blow that up a lot bigger so I could see yeah. you, but it doesn't let me. If you hit the scroll down, you can see all of them and just it'll erase you. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to show you something. I think you all find this very interesting, okay? So, how many of y'all like that house? Or at least think it's somewhat got potential. It's got potential. Miss Coleman, what you think? You look pretty decent there. All right, Miss Vita. All right, Giovanni, what you think? I think it's got potential. Got potential. Same. Same. Yep. Why? Okay. It's like that. So, so something that we could all agree that it it has potential. All right. And I'll even tell you a little something about this house. The individual that built this house was actually the individual that Bryan College Station is named after. Uh, the Cavics actually ended Thomas up. Thomas College Station? Uh, Brian, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brian. Uh, Thomas College Station. He actually was the head attorney for Brian. Like he was a big dog in Brian and all. Um, so a lot of potential here. All right. You can kind of see what it used to look like, how it was all nice and neat and done. Okay. Really nice. Uh, and you got to love the, the view of the backyard. Okay. As you're standing here, because right over in here is your cemetery. So what happens is, is that the individual that lived here, all right, you can't kind of see it all, but the individual that lived here, actually, let me see if I can't find the most recent one. We've got a history here. Let's 
See, they actually do not have it in there. Oh, God. Well, they done stole it. Yep, they took it down, so I can't actually pull it up. But what has happened is, is I used to have a photo up. Actually, let me try one more thing. I know one more place that I can go. I have a question. Almost 6,000 square feet. That's not, it's a, yeah. Not it's a nice house. Okay, yeah, let's pull this up. Really weird. Weird. It's just weird. Yeah. All right, so when sure. you drive, you come over here. This is the house on the right-hand side. But let me go up a little bit more. A little bit more. Right here, where all this tree and all stuff is, so there's the house. Right here with all the trees, that's your cemetery. And guess who's buried there? The owner and his wife and his dog. Okay? And one other thing, his child died and is also there. So when you're standing over here, by the way, this part right here, if you can see it, I don't know if y'all can really see it, but this part right here, at the back of the house is the kitchen. So when you're in the kitchen there's doing a window, dishes, there's a window right there. There's a you. window right there that overlooks the cemetery. Okay. <laughs> okay. So in that situation, Miss Vita, if you happen to want it to drive around, it's it's right there. You just put the address in and it'll show you. But uh, what ends up happening, I don't even know if it'll let me go up. Yeah, you can kind of see it. So, Okay, you see all this is concrete right in here. There's a little, see that gate back there? This whole little, little area? That's your cemetery. Okay? This whole little thing right here is your cemetery, right in there. Well, what happened was one of my agents ended up one day, I had a client that wanted to buy it and flip it. She, she does restorations in Dallas is where she's at. And uh, she came down. And they do very large scale, I mean, large scale, take 18, 1700 homes and they flip them. Okay. And they turn them in and make them look really nice. Well, she came down and, and I went in and I showed her this one and she said, it's got a lot of potential. I want it. I want to buy it. And so my agent who happened to, at the time also was my boss at Blinn. Okay. Ended up, we went out and she's like, I don't believe you. You're lying. There's no such thing as a cemetery in the city limits. They can't do that. It has to be, you know, a certain place. And I'm like, no, there's a cemetery. She didn't behind, believe me. Behind 1880. Yeah. <laughs> so guess what happened? On October 31st, I went and showed her this house. Oh, oh, we went out to the property and went and she was walking around in here. And she was like, I got to get out of here. I have just a eerie feeling. <laughs> she walked out and she had stepped on something and she just was like, I'm out of here. She ran. Well, she stepped on their dog's grave. She got in the car and there was dogs on her shoes. And she still thinks to this day, like it's a haunted deal. And she's, she will not go around this place uh -huh. ever again, ever. But by the way, by the way, for those of you that are interested, Miss Vita, you might be interested, or McKenna, when you it's come back for the for it's the nice semester, uh, we do have good news for you. It is currently available for rent. So if y'all want to rent it out, we're in, baby. It's a house party. House party. House party. Six thousand square feet. That's a nice size so, office. Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> You have, some uh, to have fun. <laughs> Justin, doesn't they have like a super creepy uh, cellar there? Nice. Well, the whole, hey, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that was another thing. I'm glad you said that. So in that same kitchen, I wish I could find the photos. I would oh, show yeah. you all. But yeah. in the kitchen, let me try to see if it's You not. said you opened it and showed it down. Yeah. She's like, nope, I'm not going down there. Let me see I'm not going down there. That's yeah, there's just like a cellar door, like, door, like in the kitchen. So just, you're in the kitchen. Actually, here just, it is, guys. Oh, sweet. Here it is. Here. So, okay, so this is your storage shed there. There's the front. It looks nice. Okay, right there. There's your, there it is. So, Giovanni, if you want to go rent it, there's your little place you can sit right here outside the cemetery. <laughs> um, but yeah, you get your own little cemetery. Uh, let's see here. You can actually stand on top of the roof, and actually, they got a uh, patio furniture up there. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice house. That's like, a selling point right there. Yeah. I'm in. You changed all. <laughs> I was see. Good. I yeah. can show you. Yeah. You see right here? Here's the cemetery. So your your kitchen's right here. Okay, this little part of the building. Yes. 
There's the, the cemetery, but the window overlooks. You can kind of see out to the cemetery. Okay. See, that corner is the corner up closer, but yeah. I'm trying to find the kitchen. Where's that kitchen? That unnecessary. Yeah, how would you like to see that? That's the house you're living in, Wyatt. It's too, it looks like a, it's a haunted documentary. So, um, why doesn't anybody use it for business purposes for like a haunted house or something? That is very true, and that's something, Ms. Coleman, I actually thought they were going to do when they were going through this. I said, you know, like you said, for a business and law office, there's a lot of law firms here in town that they actually rent out to these different types of buildings. But for some reason, the county would not allow them to turn it into a office or commercial use. They said it had to be residential only. So the house currently has been sitting on the market with nobody willing to rent it, being vacant, and uh, it's pretty much just set there. Uh, and it's probably going to sit for a while because people just don't like cemeteries yeah. in their yards. And that's where it comes to that stigmatized property is that this property is probably going to sit for a very, very, very long time uh, before the county probably readdresses it. But um, I know for a fact, like in uh, in other towns like Navasota, Hempstead, Caldwell, um, Hearn, a lot of times in those situations, they'll go in and they will revitalize these and turn them into law firms and things to that yeah. nature. But for some reason, the county here in Brazos declined their petition uh, and that now has to stay residential, which is ridiculous. So it's now just going to be sitting there and it's probably going to sit for a very long time. I mean, I wouldn't mind it being a, a law firm or a real estate office or whatever. I think it would be pretty nice, but I wouldn't want to stay there. Like I wouldn't want to sleep overnight. Right? So, um, but it was, it was creepy, guys. I'm not going to lie. When I showed that property, it was creepy because every little thing you think of, like the eerie staircase and all that, this had everything you could think of in regards to a haunted house. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. I wish you could find that, that property we showed Leonie. What I really... That one in Katie or whatever, Justin, you know about? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll find yeah. that one again. <laughs> what I'm curious about, I'm just curious is I'm wondering if it's still, I think it should still be up there. Is it still? It's, oh, they're doing a private one. I was uh, going to say, I was going to say, if we all, all wanted to go over there and let's schedule a time and meet, I was going to have y'all go over there. But, late as possible. Yeah, <laughs> late as possible. Midnight, bro. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't. It's still they it's they only allow private, private showings. Midnight on Halloween. Yeah. Well, I wish I could have took y'all because I, I do try to like take y'all to some of these if I can, but it's not, not some of these, but some. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> just, just because you do need to be kind of aware of these things, guys and gals, is you're going to have clients, especially for some reason. I'm not going to lie to you, honey. Out in Dallas, a lot of people come down here from Dallas that do rehabs. Like they come down, they'll rehab for maybe two, three months, they get the house, and then they head back up to Dallas, and then they put it on the market, and then they just go back home. So there's just something about Dallas that people just come down here a lot. So, but again, pretty interesting, right, Miss Vita? Miss McKenna, what do you think? Miss Coleman, what do you think about that? Crazy, ain't it? So is it saying that the house is worth one hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars? Yep, that's the assessed. That's the assessed, assessed. property, so. and if you notice, it's assessed at one fifty-eight. But had it not had a cemetery in the back. How much do y'all think it would be worth? Wow. Probably close to four or five. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So again, very, very important here because like it says, that's where you see it in actual reality is that you do run into these stigmatized properties. And that's just how it is. Yeah. Okay, maybe this is morally wrong, but like if there ever was a buyer that wanted to take the like caskets out, that's not they can have that. you want to know why they can't take it out? And that's the question everybody always asks. This picture right here. When it the reason that they got this, so they get tax rebates and stuff like that. If it is designated as a historical marker, you can't do nothing. Like even when they refinish the property, you have to run everything by this historical from this company for them to actually allow the renew the renovation. 
So you can never remove them. You could yeah. have like replace the floors without yeah. having to go through. Yeah, like so the house the house the like, yeah. So but the goal of it right? is well, the goal of the historical society is to try to preserve the history. Uh, yeah, is the goal. So like when we were going and I was showing the stuff, that was my very first time ever dealing with historical stuff. Very first time. And I walked around and everything, and we were going through, and she was sitting there like, okay, well, we got to, we only can do 30% of the flooring with this kind of stuff, so we can't do this. So, you know, I was thinking, well, rip it all out and put yeah. this in on it. And she's like, no, I can't do that, because if I rip it out, then I lose my historical designation, yeah. which loses my benefits. And this society also will give money. It, it will also give money in regards to basically preserving it, okay? Uh, but again, it's very interesting because me personally, yeah, I would want to rip all that stuff out, get it out of there, make it look nice. But if you do that, you lose that historical thing and you're pretty much done. I guess he just didn't want anybody else to live there, so he put his body there. Well, yeah. back then it was normal yeah. yes. for you to bury yourself on your property. Yeah. But over time, we don't do that. We bury ourselves in regards to a cemetery. But, and one of the, you know why the main reasons why they stopped doing that? You know why? The burying in your own house. Burying in your own house. Do you know why? Probably because they can't sell you one else. Nope. <laughs> your body decays. Mm -hmm. And what happens with your body if it decays? Smells. Well, not smells. It gets into the soil, yeah. which can then get into the water, which yeah. then gets into your drinking water, which can then kill other people. Huh. I mean, that's logical. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because your body decays. Now this is a city, but back then they used to deal septic tanks. Okay, you have your well down in the ground, your body de uh, decomposes, gets into the soil, gets into that water, water yeah. comes in, you drink it, kill you, or get you sick. Make sense? That's why we put it all in one location. Question? Is he, is he putting this cemetery? You have to be more aware of that, like groundwater things, since it's designated. Mm -hmm. That's why when you have cemeteries, houses cannot be built within so many miles, or not miles, but so many basically yards. Yeah, like the miles. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to kind of get them out so far because the body, if there's any decomp decomposition and things to that nature, and you also got to understand, people are putting wooden crates in the ground, they're putting metal crates, they're putting all these different things in the ground yeah. that could end up contaminating the water, so that's why it has to be so far apart. Yeah. My grandparents live on property in the Grange, and like, on their dirt road, there's enough nuts to put them in the cemetery that they don't own. And when they were building a, a well with the windmill to that, they had to put it on the back side of the property because that was too close to the, the yeah. mm -hmm. cemetery. Yeah. Also yeah. Just like when you start getting into sewage, you're not going to be tested on this, but when you get into sewage, if like I have a client that me and one of my agents are working with, they're looking at close to about, I think it was 300 acres that they're mm -hmm. looking to buy. Um, and so the house is there, it's got two sewage tanks in it, but it also has the aerobotic system where it sprays your, uh, basically sprays the stuff across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you cannot put gardens or any type of food or vegetables in those areas where those sprayers are. Because if you end up doing that, what ends up happening is, is it contaminates the food, you bring it inside, you eat it, you get sick. Yeah. So it's just those different types of methods that you have to go. And that's why I tell people, just because you may think 300 acres is a lot, well, this place has two big buildings on it. What that means is most of your stuff that you want to use the land for, you can't because you've got sprayers. So you got to kind of be aware of these different situations. Does that make sense? All right. All right. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? What about in the country area if they have a cemetery? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asking because we have a family cemetery in the country. It's probably okay. like on about 10 acres. There's okay. a dirt road. Uh -huh. And then there's uh, maybe half an acre across the street, and then there's a house right there. Is that like too close or? Well, it's a cemetery. In, in the in the in the country, does it not? Is it different from the city? As far yes. as cemetery was. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, yes, it is. And the reason that it is different than the, in the city is the country is not required to have permits. That's why a lot of people end up, say Travis wants to go out and he wants to have a big house and he wants to have, you know, uh, a racetrack out there because he likes to race cars and all these different things. 
he can get away with that more because the fact is he's in the, in the country. He's not going to be in the city limits. So, for example, one of my good friends, he ended up, he's been building himself his own shop with a, house, with a place at the top. And he has a septic tank that he's getting uh, dug in. Well, he can put his stuff wherever he wants it. However, he's taking on the own liability because what happens is, is if that septic tank gets into or contaminates the next door neighbor's property, what ends up happening in that situation is, is that individual could sue him. So really what happens is, is it puts a little bit more risk on the person. Uh, but if it's been there for such a long time, you're pretty much good. It's only if it's something new, if that makes sense. Because, does that kind of make, your, make sense, Ms. Coleman? Yes. Good. Okay. All right. You want to finish it up? Yeah, let's finish it up real quick. We're running out of time. Uh, so yeah, psychological and physical conditions outside the property that stigmatize. We went over Megan's law and the NAR guidelines for that. Um, and confidential non-material info we also covered. Suggestions for brokers. Uh, I think you can skip through that. Brokers, they're not going to be taking that test, so you can skip through that. Okay. And we just have the three review questions. All right, go for it. So a seller's disclosure is neither a warranty nor a guarantee. What does that mean to you, Wyatt? Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? What's a seller's disclosure? It's like everything that's all, everything with the house. You're right? telling me everything wrong with the house. Mm -hmm. Is it a warranty? Give me a warranty. You're going to fix it if it breaks, if I buy it from you? No, I'm just, uh, just listening to you. You're just giving me yeah. stuff, right? Are you guaranteeing anything? No, I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to fix anything. Are you guaranteeing it's going to continue to work forever? <laughs> so do you see the difference here? So a, a seller's disclosure is not going to be a warranty because you're not providing me a warranty, are you? No. Are you providing me a guarantee that it's always going to work? No. So in that situation, what is it? It's just a statement. It's a statement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. You're just saying literally. That you're just saying this yeah, is what's yeah. wrong this is what my house is no. at this point in time now i'm going to add one thing real quick and i know we're running out of time what if mr stephan here you go and uh you end up you give mr stephan your seller's disclosure okay mr stephan gets your seller's disclosure and you sent it to him when you first listed the property so say that you listed it january 1st of 2021 so you listed it january 1 2021 you gave him a seller's disclosure. You now have the seller's disclosure, but you haven't done anything. You just got it. You saw it on the MLS. Now, today, he puts an offer in on your property. But he still has the seller's disclosure from what day? From January 1st. Do things change in four months? Yeah. So what do you probably need to do? And if Mr. Carlon, you're representing him, okay, my question for you is what do you need to tell your client? You need to give him a what? <laughs> the seller's disclosure and tell him that he needs to end up, he needs to update it. Because he as a seller ain't going to think about that. But if you're the licensed individual, it's on you. Does that make sense? Go for it. Question number two. What issues are involved when an agent discovers that a new listing was previously the home of extensive drug dealers? You're buying Wyatt's house. You're buying Wyatt's house. <laughs> <laughs> So what could happen for something that had extensive drug dealing? You said chemicals, right? Yeah. That could get into the wall and everything like that. Uh, but is it a material defect? Let me actually stop. Miss Feed, are you there? Yes. Question for you. Okay. You're, uh, you've told me before that, you know, that you've dealt with construction and all. If a home is a meth lab, or there's been a meth um, operation in the home, can you truly ever actually end up getting all of that out of that home? No. So what's the best thing you got to do for that home? Demo. So even if a lot of people will think, well, I'll just take all the walls out, you know, I'll, I'll clean the boards with Clorox and all that, there's not much you can do you pretty much have to end up demoing it and starting over. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Well, that's what the chemicals. Wood absorbs stuff, so it's it does. absorb chemicals. 
I actually was watching a video. You get into a meth place, you have to have certain things over your mouth because if not, those gases can get into you and kill you quickly. Yeah, kill you okay. Go ahead. Why might a buyer want to know this information? I mean, are you going to want to buy a meth house? No. No. So it's something you would definitely. Well, let's look at it from a different way. Let's flip it. And I pick on Wyatt just because I pick on you, bro. But say, for example, <laughs> let's say Giovanni, you are actually buying Wyatt's property. Let's, I'm not going to pick on Travis. We're going to pick on Travis. You're going you to go over here. We're going to pick on Travis here. You, you end up, you want to buy Travis's house, all right? And Travis is a known drug dealer. And he, every single day, guess what ends up happening? There's always people knocking on his door going, hey, man, here, I need a dime. Come on, come on, come on, you know? Okay? Constantly. Okay? Get, get, me some, get me out here. He's constantly doing transactions. Now he's moving. What's the problem now, Mr. Uh, Giovanni? Do you need to know that information? You don't. You do. You do. Wouldn't you? I mean, if you're the one buying, I guess. I guess I would. Then. Oh, okay, yeah. Think, of, think about it from this buy. way: If you move into his house, he's left. Yeah. Stephen goes over there once a week oh, to get his okay, yeah, yeah. fix. <laughs> what's hey, What's going to end up happening? <laughs> you gonna move in? No, and he has, has, I need help with that thing. Yep. And here's Stefan coming to your door. Hey, where's where's Travis at? I need some. Guess what? You now need to know that information. So that that makes sense. Coming up to your door now, to drugs. Now let me ask you, McKenna, are you there? Yes. McKenna, I got a question. So in this situation, should you walk up, say for example, in this situation that you are representing Giovanni in the transaction, should you go over to Wyatt, who's representing Travis, and go, hey, uh, hey, Wyatt, uh, is your client a drug dealer? <laughs> should, should you ask that, McKenna? No. 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 Because you don't, you don't know that, okay? But what you need to do, and I always tell my clients this, is I always tell my, if I'm representing a buyer, I tell my buyers to drive around the property before they buy it. Drive a couple of times. You got a 10 day option period? Drive by the house morning, afternoon, and night. Why do I do that? Check it out. Check it out. Because it, at one point, what are we hoping? We're hoping that the client's gonna see Stefan show up at Travis's house, knocking on the door trying to do a, a drug transaction or some type of transaction, and we can question that. Do you see what I'm saying? But you never just blatantly go, Hey, Wyatt, is your person a drug uh, a drug dealer? Okay, they're not going to disclose that, nor are you wanting to ask that question. But it can, in some situations, it can stigmatize an area. Does that make sense? Okay. Go ahead. All right. Final question, and we'll be done. Um, how many of you would feel comfortable buying and moving into a house which there has been a murder suicide only three months ago? Go ahead. No, you just said you would. You would? Uh, yeah, I would. You would? You would? Yeah. yeah. What about online? Would, would you feel comfortable uh, moving in? Thumbs no. up. Thumbs up. If you would, thumbs down if you wouldn't. No. Yeah. Everyone's saying no. <laughs> I guess you're the odd man out. Huh? No. Actually, what about you looking for a cheap deal? Me and him would. Yeah, I would, I would There's work. three, and I would too. You know why? Ghosts. Because, what? well, no, here's the thing. I'll Think be, about it, Giovanni. What? I'll fight you. Here's the thing. I'll fight you. How many of y'all just said no? Most of you. Majority, right? Yeah. Even those of you online, majority of you said, heck, no. Yeah. So what does that mean in regards to the price of that it's house? Going it's going to be nice price house. That thing's going to be cheap. Okay? So that $250,000 house, I'm going to buy it for what? Like Maybe 80. Yeah. I like it. I'll, I'll 80. How about, oh, I'm, not even, I'm not even going to move into it. I'm not even going to move into it. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to go in and have it thoroughly cleaned and redone. But don't you self-enlist it, though, Lewis? Oh, yes, yes, we still have them. Well, not truthfully, it it's but it's going to be out there. Yeah. It's already going to be out there. But it doesn't matter, because here's the thing. I'm not going to sell it in the same year. <laughs> I'm going to hold it for a year, maybe two years, and then what am I going to do? Put it on the market, and I'm going to get pre premium price. Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So in real estate, as Travis knows, because his dad was in, in basically in this kind of stuff, is you have to understand you got to go after the things that everybody else doesn't want make it appealing okay you get the things that other people don't want make it look nice 
hold on to it, and then what eventually happens? Steroid. Right. Steroid will go away like it shows here. What about 10 years ago? Well, 10 years, now we're going to start seeing, would you move in after 10 okay, years? 10 years about, what about 100 months. years? Yeah, that's way different. You see what I'm saying? But the same thing, that's buying and moving in, not buying in and flipping. Well, I'd still move in. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd just That's say on the moving in perspective, I would, I would think after three months I couldn't buy. Logically, money-wise, that sounds like a way better idea. I, I will move in and live in a house for a year to two years. It's been a murder-suicide because I'm buying a house cheap. <laughs> okay? It's a business, man. It's all business. Yeah, business. There is no personal when it comes to business. It's all business. Okay? <laughs> so, again, good points. All right. All right. We're That's done. That's it for the evening. We got...